So um, let's see here, I'll advance my own slide. Um, the objectives today are to highlight ESG fraud categories and risks for folks on the session to gain comfort with some relevant publications and guidance and increase your comfort and your competence for fraud risk assessment and testing. So you can do this too. And my agenda is going to be to review a recent publication and to provide some examples and perspectives. Uh, as a consultant, I always make it a point to provide a disclaimer. This does not uh, constitute a consulting engagement. Um, I'm not a CPA or a CFE. Uh, thank you for the ACFE for having me here as well. I'm an engineer with an MBA, but have been in this field, including working on financial audits and internal audits for a long time. So um, earlier this year, the ACFE and Grant Thornton um, issued a joint publication called Managing Fraud Risks in an Evolving ESG Environment. If you do a Google search, you can find it. Um, this is a really good publication. So hats off to ACFE, hats off to Grant Thornton. Um, it stitches together, as you'll see, all the things that you know or should know about fraud and applies an ESG overlay. Now, it can be, uh, sometimes you don't have time to read a, a primary document. Sometimes they can be a little hard to wade through. Uh, so for this segment of our session, it'll be a little bit like book club that will go through some of these sections. Well, what is ESG and, and, and what is fraud? We, we've all seen the pillars for environmental social governance. Every session begins with a pillar like this. Many of the topics are not confined to one particular pillar. This is really just a taxonomy for where to put non-financial information and, and topics for the purposes of reporting and disclosures, for the purposes of organizing internal controls, and to develop um, programs. Thank you, Tina, for putting that post up there. So um, the report, I, I really like the graphic they put in this report because they have the issues in clouds as to pillars. You know, clouds come and go and they move and they expand and they contract. And they put some topics kind of in between all the clouds. So I think this is a terrific idea for just starting to get your mind around ESG and what all the topics are and some of the challenges for both managing the issues and in particular, how you address ESG fraud risk. Well, what, what is fraud? Um, fraud denotes a criminal act to be proven in a court of law. Fraud risk is the possibility that a fraudulent activity could occur. I like what they say, they differentiate between mismanagement, negligence, incompetence, and, and malicious intent. So what, where do you draw the line in terms of what constitute fraud? I think we might see some evolution there in the ESG space. They describe greenwash as putting a positive spin on otherwise questionable information. I think we'll see the line there blur over the next couple of years. And they also describe virtue signaling as kind of a negative term for expressing a moral viewpoint to communicate good character. We heard about ethics today. We're such a good character organization. We have such good ethics, but it's just really to inflate their own reputation. And even if their position is disingenuous or, um, or, or maybe not true. A number of years back, some of the tobacco companies were saying, for example, you know, we support um, responsible recreational use of tobacco products. Well, it's not responsible, according to a lot in the medical community and people trying to make investments there. So what, what, is, what is ESG fraud? When you couple those, those two terms together, what is it exactly? Well, before we jump into that, we're going to launch a polling question. And just from what you know now, and for sure you know the Cressy Fraud Triangle, as opportunity, incentive, and pressure, just just by hearing the terms ESG fraud, 
what do you think is weakest in preventing ESG fraud? And here come the votes. So managing fraud risk in terms of ESG, um, the report says that over 40% of Russell 1000 companies have announced a commitment to reduce carbon emissions, and a quarter of them are disclosing net zero emission commitments by 2050. Um, I think in the larger companies that might be low, you might see higher uh, percentages than that. This report came out before the recent COP27 conference. That's often a venue where companies disclose commitments like this. Uh, the ESG assets under management grew explosively, and there's no sign of that letting up. Um, if you've heard my presentations before, you've heard about conflict minerals, and you've heard about the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act. Um, that law in particular has driven a lot of seizures at the border for products that are suspected of being um, made with forced or child labor. The Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act is unique, uh, just went into effect this year, in that there is a rebuttable presumption that if you are importing products that include silica, tomatoes, or cotton, those are things uh, made in significant quantity in the Uyghur area of China, using forced labor, that if you are importing a product that includes that, they presume that it's made with forced labor unless you can prove otherwise. That's a little different from the due diligence requirements in years past. And the number of shipments held at the border, like there's a lot of extra room at the ports to hold this stuff, uh, has gone from 12 to 1400 just in three years. Um, and I wasn't sure the year to date on 2022. So um, here's some enforcement, and it might pose an incentive for people to give the right answers to get products in, um, in, in through customs. So the report differentiates between internal and external fraud. Internal is committed by um, management or employees. Um, their intentional acts to deceive others by reporting false or misleading information. So you can uh, do that by commission. You can do that by omission, by omitting material ESG facts. Now, I've uh, done sessions here, and there's plenty of stuff on my website about non-financial reporting. When you're providing facts and data to someone, the answer is, well, who are you providing the facts to and what is material to them? So there's materiality from a financial perspective. There's materiality from the ESG perspective for stakeholders that you are reporting to. So material definition is getting kind of fluid in the ESG area, um, but you have to start with the things that are significant to the folks making decisions, decision useful information. It can include improper disclosure of initiatives, programs and metrics. For example, the failure to disclose use of child labor or forced labor. And it often occurs due to lack of oversight, poor accountability and a weak or, or non-existent control environment. External ESG fraud can be conducted by parties outside the organization. Much of the ESG compliance and risk and reporting um, relies upon information and data that originates outside an organization. It might originate from a supply chain. It might originate with a building owner or landlord, a business partner, um, sales vendors, contractors, um, any any place and the ESG um, facts, data and information needs to come into the organization so that um, so that uh, an organization can develop and prepare their own reporting and disclosures about ESG topics. So outside the organizations, they may emit a material fact or disclose false and misleading information. And as the suppliers really feel the pressure to adopt ESG policies that are consistent with the customer expectations, 
they are really feeling the pressure. Uh, 10 years ago, I was helping an organization develop the programs for conflict minerals. And uh, the expectations and questionnaires that come in from the customer side are um, really all over the place. And many of those questionnaires, many of the requirements indicated a lack of familiarity with the laws and the regulations and the difficulties of getting um, good, reliable data and information from a supply chain. So if a customer would say, for example, will you commit to being conflict-free in, in one year? Um, supply chains are, are long. Uh, they can be opaque, especially when you go back to a smelter and then back again to a mine. Um, and you knew what the right answer was supposed to be. And you also knew the practical aspects of how would you live up to that answer? So when the customers would say, you know, we're using this as a decision as to whether or not we buy your product, that creates a lot of pressure. We're seeing this more now for a forced labor, for human rights, for sourcing of materials in sustainable fashions that the, uh, we, we hear a lot about public reporting to capital markets, but the B2B communications and reporting and requirements are, are just eating everybody's lunch. And often uh, there is the pressure to conform and there is uh, scarce um, mechanisms and controls and resources to, to even allow uh, a company to conform if they wanted to. One example on external fraud uh, was the sale of fraudulent green investments to supply desirable commission uh, emission credits to offset greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I was on a webinar just this week from one of the big four uh, doing an ESG webinar and, and the emissions reduction credits and the tax sales was a, a topic of interest and discussion. And with everything that's happening now on uh, the SEC climate rule, on global climate rules and like, uh, I think this will be a topic of more interest. Polling question number two, we're going to look ahead at the categories that are traditional in the ES in the ACFE fraud tree. So for these four categories, what would our listeners, attendees think is the easiest to commit ESG? fraud. So here the ACFE Occupational Fraud and Abuse Classification System is often referred to as the fraud tree. In addition to the ACFE fraud tree categories, the ACFE and Grant Thornton added another category called non-financial reporting fraud. And look at that, that consistent with our polling results, they had nine examples under non-financial reporting fraud and if you look at the other four, three categories uh, added together, that adds up to nine. So the 50%, we have a very smart group of people here watching this session. So uh, I don't know if that's coincidence or if that's uh, they studied ahead. Um, here, this is figure three from the, from the uh, document. I really encourage you to get that. They did such a good job on this. And it shows the fraud tree with that new category over there for non-financial reporting. We're going to take a stroll through this and uh, see what some of these categories look like. So um, why is non-financial reporting a separate category? What's, what's the reason for that? Uh, well, it's because there's so many ways, so many avenues, so many channels that companies have to do non-financial reporting. Uh, the SEC is one for sure. Um, the EU has their own rules coming out on uh, supply chain due diligence. ISSB is uh, under the auspices of the IFRS Foundation. It sets the standards for international accounting rules. Um, what used to be SASB is now in the ISSB. Um, green bond principles are principles based. If you want to get green money, uh, often at a bond that is oversubscribed or at a better interest rate, there's criteria that you have to report to the um, entity that issues those. Um, sustainability consortium is a B2B uh, reporting. 
um, mechanism in the retail sector. And that V down at the right is one of many analysts. This one is Ecovetus. There are many analysts that mine information in SEC filings, sustainability reports, and elsewhere to do ratings and rankings for purposes of investors and other stakeholders to use in making key decisions. So this can include any KPI or related operations. Um, it's also consistent with um, the current effort on COSO. Uh, I'm one of six authors in a, in, of a document that will be released in January um, linking the COSO internal controls framework to ESG. And the internal controls framework, when it was reissued, they made it a point of saying, you know, that middle slab, that middle column there, it used to say financial reporting. It doesn't anymore. It's any kind of reporting, including non-financial reporting. So um, we needed the category for it because it's just so easy to do that. So the book had an example, uh, the publication had an example of harvest mixing. Uh, this is very common in the agricultural sector um, and, and natural resources sector, where an entity will mix valid goods with illicit goods and say, oh, they're all good. And the example, and there was a fish supplier uh, that discloses fish as legally caught when only a small portion was legally harvested. Um, this is, uh, you may have heard of the California Transparency and Supply Chain Act. Um, it requires traceability and supply chain and policies and a statement uh, on a company's homepage of their website, some pretty pricey real estate. Um, and the CATISCA, as it's called, empowers the California Attorney General to bring lawsuits against companies uh, if, if they're running afoul of that law. Among the first enforcement cases were fish, um, including an action taken against Costco. What often happens in the South China Sea is that people get promised high you know, paying jobs. Um, they leave small villages in Malaysia, Philippines and the like and get on a fishing boat. The employer takes their passport. They go out to sea in uh, squalid conditions. And when they come back near shore, they don't come to the shore. They offload the fish to other boats that go back to shore and the workers don't get on land. And they are held in this condition for years. And if anybody objects, then over the side they go. You know, So there are laws now on the, fact, on the books in the US to uh, require companies to investigate the supply chain and not buy fish from those suppliers. Other examples, uh, there is a, a demand for sustainably sourced wood, and it can be mixed with wood from deforestation, from cutting down the rainforest in Indonesia or Brazil. There can be ethically sourced diamonds mixed in with blood diamonds. We've seen the movie a number of years back. And um, I mentioned the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. It's hard to tell one piece of silica from another. It's hard to tell one diamond from another. So it puts the onus on companies to do some supply chain tracing. So when it comes to fraud, there's E, there's S, there's G. Um, so what, what is some fraud that would map to the E? Well, there's harvest mixing. Um, there are any number of environmental standards, environmental management systems, green seal, whatever, you know, fair trade coffee, um, that you can manipulate the standards you can manipulate data provided to auditors to get those standards. Um, one I think we'll see a lot more of is to inflate carbon credit value. Companies are under intense pressure to reduce carbon emissions. It's one thing to turn out the lights when you leave the office at night, but it's another thing to reduce emissions on shipping a product or service. Um, so there's a lot of pressure to reduce uh, carbon emissions, including more than an organization can possibly do on their own. So what companies will do is to buy renewable energy credits or carbon reduction credits. Um, those credits have a vintage. The, the credits have a value. They can be used to offset in emissions in current years or future years. So it's really kind of a a futures market, if you will. 
Um, and the price of carbon is variable and it's really not well determined. Um, carbon credits can trade for 20 to $40. Um, I think many companies are using $50 now. Uh, the Biden administration has, there's a law in the books that requires the administration to research and publish a social cost of carbon every year. That uh, number was just released in the range of $160 a ton. So there's a matter of estimation here in terms of what will be required and the value of what's on the books now. And without rigorous uh, processes and internal controls, uh, those numbers can start to look very, very different based upon those assumptions. And there's can be bribery for illegal logging, harvest, encroachment on natural preserves, dumping in national parks, uh, bribery to just look the other way. And we hear about that in the Brazil rainforest and in Colombia, but it happens in this country too. So uh, there is fraud that can arise to the E. Fraud can also map to the S, the social. Um, we've heard about the, the unfortunate, the tragic Rana Plaza disaster where the uh, building in Bangladesh burned up with a lot of people in it in the garment industry. Um, that is one actually of many. Um, a lot of retailers will go and do supply chain audits or depend upon others for audits. Um, the people in those companies can conceal the conditions. The auditors, um, you know, be paid to look the other way. They may be in collusion with local governments. You, you just never really know uh, what can go wrong. Uh, there can be falsified diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics. Um, it can be non-conforming to the social services, a nonprofit soliciting money for, let's say, veterans relief, who siphons it off for, um, you know, personal goods and luxury lifestyles. <clears throat> Forced savings and deposit accounts uh, occur um, often when uh, people must pay to get uh, hired for a job and they are uh, forced to pay back a, a fee, a hiring fee by automatic withdrawal from their wages. And oftentimes uh, they are released from their employment before they fulfill that obligation. So it, it is a form of indentured servitude um, and that um, occurs more places than you might think. So mapping to the G in governance, what are some ESG examples of ESG fraud? Um, you can misrepresent or underreport suspicious activity. Um, gee, we only sold one package to Iran. It's not really a big deal or you know anything like, like that in terms of compliance or reporting. Um, there's many things here that are familiar to the auditors in the room, capital expenditure, misclassification, illegal tax shelters, that there's tremendous, uh, a, a lot of tax provisions for renewable energy, for energy efficiencies, um, for buildings in un underserved neighborhoods, for affordable housing. There are a lot of tax shelters and a lot of tax consequences. And uh, the funds can be manipulated and the performance uh, against the conditions of those funds can be done uh, not in accordance with um, the requirement that can be sloppy, it can be intentional. So where is the line for fraud? So the fraud impacts, um, the, the book uh, discusses financial risk, reputational risk, and compliance risk. Of course, there's the risk you'll lose money. Um, there's the risk that you can lose reputation. Um, ESG is now among the top um, factors in attracting and retaining talent. So if you're in a field where talent is important in IT, technology, professional services, operations, driving delivery trucks, name it, um, ESG performance is, is pretty important. Um, as we do this session today, the uh, teacher's assistants, and uh, I think it's about 40,000 people at the UC uh, University system are on strike because they're 
they're not getting paid or they're not getting paid what they believe is a fair wage. Um, there are stories in the press this week about uh, a teacher assistant getting paid for an assignment and then being required to take another course towards graduation and doing exactly the same thing they were doing when they were paid. So in one week, they're getting paid for doing something. The next week, they're paying to take a class, but doing the same thing and offloading work from the professor and not getting paid. So, you know, that might, is that, uh, you know, just not right? Is it okay? Or the way it's reported or the way it's calculated, um, is that a reputational risk or, or is it fraud or is it just wrong? So the dust is yet to settle on a lot of this, but we do see things in the press, um, including now, um, that make us realize we need to pay more attention to this in the world of audit and risk management. Materiality is a topic that comes up a lot. So what is material? Um, I say, well, material according to whom? Um, accountants looking at financial statements are accustomed to the uh, definition of materiality for financial reporting. Um, I really like this sentence in the, uh, the report that the question of what constitutes material information when it comes to ESG is still largely unanswered. However, the organization can rely on one question. Would this affect a stakeholder's decision making? So for an investor, the question of materiality has been pretty much settled uh, by law, by the big four, by the accountants, by the ASCPA, by the whole profession um, under GAAP. So in ESG and sustainability context, it's a little different because investors are a very important stakeholder group. So are regulators and so are customers. So materiality starts to take on a little different, different view. Um, the GRI is a framework that is uh, was established about 25 years ago as a taxonomy, if you will, and to encourage companies to do voluntary sustainability reporting. Um, there are probably two, three, 400 topics that a company could report about. Nobody can do everything, so where do you start? So GRI encouraged companies to do a materiality assessment, and, and I really wish they had picked a different term. Um, I think they are, are, that's one of the reasons folks are confused because materiality is used in a lot of different contexts. Uh, but suffice it to say, it follows the same kind of risk assessment process. Um, they could have used significant, but they just use materiality. And so they are uh, encouraging companies to engage with stakeholders and ask for the people interested in this report, what matters to you? So in the, adver in the absence of any kind of standardized framework for ESG reporting, broadly speaking, organizations should apply a consistent process for deciding what is material and what is not. I would say here that um, SASB, now part of ISSB, applied the SEC definitions to come up with disclosure topics that are material for investors. So we'll, that will constitute one of our examples in breakout sessions here in the next session. So here's, we get now to another polling question. Let's see what we got here. are starting to show that it's not so difficult when you understand some of the basic concepts of, of the fraud tree and you start to see some of these tangible examples that are so nicely written in this report, um, you can see how you can put the two together and that can make you um, smarter as you go through some brainstorming, as you go through engagement planning, as you do some testing, as you start to look at uh, disclosures and reporting to the financial markets and elsewhere. So the report closes here in the closing minutes. I think I have about, what, 10 minutes left. Um, there are five principles for ESG fraud risk, and these are principles for any kind of fraud, risk governance, 
risk assessment, control activity, and investigative and corrective actions and monitoring activities. So here's audit all over the place here. Um, each one of these has its own examples in the ACFE report in Grant Thornton. There's some examples on the left for fraud risk governance. Do you have policies and procedures to measure employee and vendor actions to apply the relevant ESG frameworks? I have some supplemental perspectives there on the right side of the screen, where here are some standards and frameworks for investors where you might want to start. Um, there's some other examples for uh, general public reporting. There's some frameworks for the analysts, Ecovetus, Sustainalytics, Bloomberg bought one of them, Standard & Poor's is one. That's a industry that is yet to consolidate. Uh, if you read a New York Times op ed piece a few weeks ago, uh, ESG investing is a sham. Um, they were making the point that these analysts really have not got their act together to do consistent analysis, that the spread for ESG ratings was really across the board, whereas the spread for credit ratings was pretty nicely clustered. And 90% of the S&P 500 made it into one ESG fund or another. So the analyst community, I think, knows they have to uh, get their act together. Uh, but they, in turn, are looking back to companies to have more decision useful reporting. So, so it's all going to come back to internal controls and what and companies uh, report. Uh, there are a number of industry efforts and supply chain due diligence monitoring efforts. There's a lot of places you can go to get information if you're looking for fraud risk governance. So for fraud risk assessment, um, there are several examples in the ACFE report to incorporate it in current risk assessments. I love that. To do standard, standalone uh, ESG fraud risk assessments. Can't beat it. Uh, revol review controls and specific areas of opportunities for risk mitigation. This is what we do all the time. So if you just apply an ESG overlay to what you're already doing, you will improve your effectiveness on identifying and mitigating fraud risk for ESG. So uh, my supplemental perspectives are just embed this into the design of policies and procedures. Uh, policies and procedures for supply chain, price cost, price uh, delivery quality, uh, they were put in place before we thought about forced labor. Um, so some of these policies are in need, I would say, of a refresh for things that, for internal and external. I also uh, would encourage folks to consider both hard incentives and what I call soft incentives. Um, yeah, it's one thing to misappropriate assets, to inflate value of carbon credits, to make the income statement look a little better. Uh, in this kind of soft and squishy place, I have seen many examples where uh, people sort of go over the line, I would say, for making statements and promises and, and communications for prestige. Uh, they want an award. They want to get in an ESG fund. They want to B plus, get that B plus up to an A rating for one of these different groups. And that is very powerful in the ESG space. So uh, pay attention from that. And some of the stuff, if you're not looking at money, well, what's the harm? You know, for many companies, that prestige, that intangible value is the significant, if not the major, component of their market cap, that intangible value is a major issue and prestige drives a lot of that. For control activities where audit and compliance and risk live, um, the ACFE and Grant Thornton report uh, touts a, a strong supply chain control environment, strong ESG disclosure reporting controls, we will be seeing a lot about that in the in the coming months, and we've seen a lot about it before, but it, it's going to get, I would say, even higher. Um, there are efforts involving supply chain that are already required for compliance. So there are many things in your organization that are in place that you may or may not know about. There are many precedents in some of these laws for how companies have evolved their internal systems and controls that are scalable 
and leverageable for other ESG controls. Um, I, I submitted comments to the SEC on the Dodd-Frank conflict minerals rules. They listened to the comments for myself and hundreds of others. And what came out in the final rule reflected those comments. And the SEC in a lot of way got that right, I would say. Um, now we're waiting on comments for the uh, climate disclosure rule. There were over 14,000 comments received. Uh, many of them form letters, but at least a thousand were considered valid uh, comments. It's by far the most comments received on any rule in years. Uh, SEC had to reopen that comment period, do a technical glitch in, uh, in October for a couple of weeks. Um, and nobody's really a betting person, but uh, the bet is that SEC will release something in first quarter next year that will be final. Uh, but many of the conflict minerals practices and policies uh, would apply or from some of these other laws. I would say also, remember that you, you have a supply chain. We all know that we are, are in a, we have a supply chain. We buy things. Um, <clears throat> we have financial services partners. We buy goods. We buy services. You're also in somebody else's supply chain. And every company, every organization the federal government, out everybody will be working up their supply chain for ESG reporting and disclosures, for commitments, for progress. So the control activities that you put into place to look upstream, you should be aware that they should harmonize to the extent possible with control activities you have that will, you will be at the business end of coming from your, your value stream. So whatever you can do to align those, what sense does it make to calculate emissions using one methodology for the supply chain and a completely different methodology from the value chain? Something's not going to be right. And then think about your disclosures. Who are you disclosing to and via what channel? Is it public or is it um, B2B or, or private? So. Fraud risk monitoring activities um, confirm your hotline whistleblower capabilities, uh, provide related anti-fraud training. Uh, I think that's a great idea. I think the content of ESG-related anti-fraud training will evolve pretty quickly as the awareness of it um, starts to, to kick in and we see more examples of ESG fraud. Um, EHS, Navex reported that about five to six percent every year, year on year, they say that the tips received are about environmental health and safety, um, which kind of sounds like a lot. But even so, EHS does not include things like harassment, fair wages, and, and many other things that would fall under the umbrella of ESG, as it is included in many of the reporting frameworks today. Um, and second line of, uh, of defense audit programs, I consider those to be environmental audit, safety audit, supply chain audit, quality audit. There, there's a lot of audits that go on out there. Um, I don't see a lot of them well connected with third line with the internal audit. Um, I don't see many of them doing quality assurance reviews, and I see very few of them uh, with any kind of fraud awareness or testing for fraud. Um, it's one thing I've said many times that for um, the internal audit functions to increase the effectiveness of compliance and risk mitigation in some of these high risk areas, a really good place to start would be to do a wall-to-wall -wall review of any second line audit program that is in place. So um, let's go back, there's one more. So investigations and corrective actions. If something comes as a tip, you'll have to investigate. Um, the KPIs and the K key risk indicators are still uh, immature areas. Um, here, here are some examples here that are all kind of how would you get this information? How would you get this data? How would you know if it was right? Um, even what, what is the scope of it? What's in and what's out? Um, and I, I really encourage everybody to seek uh, IT input for the analytics um, on cross-functional teams that I've been involved with. Um, IT is often conspicuously absent. 
Um, a lot of times they don't know why they need to be there. Most of the time they're busy, um, but they really need to be involved with this because uh, there will be a big call to move a lot of unstructured data to more structured data um, for reporting and disclosures and, and risk mitigation and fraud prevention and fraud detection in the years to come. So we have one more polling question, I think. In your opinion, now we're going to go to particular topics. We've talked about kinds of fraud. Um, we've talked about your concerns. So in your opinion, ESG fraud is most pervasive in which of these topics? That everybody understood the difference between attracting capital to go into an ESG fund. How do you get people's money? And then how do you use money uh, from green bonds or other investments? So there's the potential for fraud all the way through that life cycle and everybody got some votes. So that's a great response rate from, from our viewers. That's what I got.